and basically from going from the initial idea and the prototype to um, systems that are now running in live operation and production and um, at several customer sites across Europe. Um, I structured this talk in four parts. Um, the first one would be more in the general context of um, like what are these robots doing in logistics? What is the change that we see happening in these environments? Um, and then I would go more into detail in two aspects. One of them is how are we engineering the behavior? How are we coordinating the robots? Um, and yeah, I also saw connections to some of the other talks that have been um, that are in the program today. Um, but what we also found to be really important is um, how are we managing the robot software and which processes are behind that? And I think that's something that is often overlooked more from the research point of view. So unfortunately, we didn't find many much help and guidance in, in how to do it. And also when I was at university, I wasn't even aware of these problems, but uh, we faced them pretty strongly. So how do we test software? How do we engineer it? How do we bring new code onto the robots? And um, besides these challenges also, how do we make use of the opportunities we have by having robots that are connected to the internet that can get to the software? But now when you have these chances, then you also need to know how to use them properly. So um, a few words about Magazino. So we're building software. We're also building hardware uh, for intelligent mobile picking robots. We are focusing on eco-logistics. Um, the company was founded in 2014 and since then has grown to about 110 employees. So as a startup, we are investor financed and have investors from different areas. So in Heinrich, for example, a large forklift company uh, Zalando and Figa are both large logistics companies, so a broad range of people we are working with there. Um, so if we look at robots and logistics or um, in many industrial environments, we see a change that is happening and a change in robots that are getting out of classical and traditional automation applications, such as um, industrial robot arms that are welding cars, um, many conveyor belts and other complex systems, but also AGVs and mobile robots that are often still following lines or virtual lines or showing some other very predictive behavior. And these systems have been and still are very successful and very helpful in these environments, um, but they all depend on a manually engineered environment um, where the human has understood the task and designed the tasks the robots are doing, but also the environments, the fixtures, the objects and everything else in order to take out the maximum uncertainty. So we want to have it as predictable as possible with as little disturbances as we want to have. But a conflicting uh, goal um, that uh, we're having is that we would like to work, like these robots to work together with humans. And um, that is kind of contradicting each other because um, we are all uncertain, fuzzy. Um, we're putting items not always to the exact positions. We're standing in a way, we leave things standing around. And in the, all these cases, um, the classical way of programming robots gets to the limits. And we're seeing that a new way of um, programming is needed. And many of you who are coming from a more academic um, environment probably find this pretty commonplace. So it's something that is uh, uh, happening um, in basically all robotics labs, but it hasn't really found its way into industrial applications at large scale. So, what do we think is needed for this? Um, first of all, when we're working in more open and more dynamic environments, it's really important that the robots have the capability of sensing this environment. So when they are supposed to react to changes, they first of all have to be able to detect and observe these changes and figure out how the world is different from they're expected to be. Um, the robots have chances like using the cloud, using additional computation. It doesn't have to be all on this individual device. And they can use this, for example, for learning, for modeling, for collecting information, and thereby improving their behavior. And by combining this aggregated information with the up-to-date sensor data they have, they can um, take decisions at one time and thereby specify a task that has been underspecified beforehand. So um, as a programmer, we don't have to specify the exact path that, for example, a robot arm is taking when picking or welding or something. Um, or the exact line on the ground that the robot should be following, but it's more the programming shifts more towards setting the goals and explaining to the robot which kinds of um, target goals it needs to have and which kinds of behaviors it needs to show in between 
Um, and then the robots need to figure out by themselves what to do exactly if some other actions are needed in between and so on. And the last aspect um, that we are seeing in many places is that the robots are supposed to be cooperative. They are supposed to work in teams and jointly perform a task, but they're also supposed to work alongside humans. And um, when we started, more, so I joined about six years ago, the company is about eight years old, um, we didn't see a software stack that actually supports this. So we saw that there are lots of good ideas and some first code um, research labs, um, but whenever a company wanted to really build a product and something that you can, you can sell, that is a complete solution, uh, you needed to hire a large robotics team and um, get started from this. So our mission is to um, work on this software stack, to build a stack that people can use from which they can draw um, components and help in architecture um, in order to get to this product level faster and build their own robots. But at the same time, uh, we believe that building such a software stack cannot happen in isolation. So it's really important to have the exposure to the real world and to go through all the, uh, the pains and um, problems you're facing when you're actually bringing something from the lab to, uh, to a real environment, because there you learn a lot about which problems are actually important and uh, which solutions can work. And that's why we're building our own robots. So this one here is uh, the robot tool. Um, it's um, optimized for picking cuboid items um, in, in warehouses. And I will show a short video to explain how it's working. So the robots are driving in fleets. Um, they are navigating autonomously, um, have a suction gripper where they can pull items in. They can also push items back because in these warehouses, items are normally stored in chaotic fashion. So they're not always the same items on top of each other and we have to pull it from, pull things from the middle. Um, they're working alongside humans, can detect them, can safely drive around them. But the humans are basically operating in the same environment, they're picking the same items, and they're also modifying the environment. So here a robot has some prior knowledge of where the object was, a human has in between picked another item, has moved this one, and the robot always has to perceive how the world actually is, then adapt its movement, and um, check, for example, here, a spot that was supposed to be free is still free when it's uh, storing items. So it seems like a really boring and stupid environment of a roboticist that is used to um, doing like pancake making or other things from in the research lab looks at it. Um, but when you really want to solve such a task um, with a really high reliability and um, in a setting where it's not you who's sitting next to the robot, but um, the uh, warehouse workers that are that are working there and if they are supposed to, to use this, um, still becomes pretty complex and the robot has to be able to handle all kinds of disturbances of um, special um, conditions and so on by itself. Um, in addition to Toho, we are currently building a second product, Sutto, like the, the larger brother, um, it was transporting these euro containers, here these more or less standardized plastic boxes. Um, that are ubiquitous in production supply there. So there they are brought from the storage to the assembly line and back. And usually behind these shelves, there are humans who are then um, assembling things and they get basically the fresh material brought in these plastic boxes. So that, those are the kinds of robots we are uh, talking about. They're mobile, they're driving around, they're connected to each other and they're also connected uh, to our cloud for um, sharing information, for sharing computation, but also for getting software updates. So let's look at how we are programming these kinds of systems. So um, which structures are behind that? So we are calling our software stack across AI. And um, this consists of software on four different layers. The top layer is what you see from the outside. So it's uh, components, for example, for navigating around an environment, um, for building a map and localizing the robot inside there, for perceiving and grasping a box. But also, which is a bit more behind the scenes, uh, the uh, self-diagnostics and uh, the handling of different kinds of exceptions, be it 
environment problems that a path is blocked, be it hardware problems that a sensor is dirty or motor is broken. Um, all of these kinds of things have to be handled by the robot autonomously and the robot needs to decide by itself what is a proper escalation and proper handling for these kinds of problems. So once we have these kinds of apps, um, they have to be integrated into a common behavior and a common execution flow. And this is what our cross core uh, level does. And I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail uh, in a minute. But um, basically the core, uh, we're using the behavior tree as the main execution platform here, is deciding in which order will these different functional components be called, um, which exceptions, uh, exception handling do we have to do, how do we actually compose the overall behavior out of these individual behaviors that are there. So it's basically taking the decision what to do at which point in time under which conditions. And it does so by having on the one hand the behavior rules, um, having input from the uh, from the cameras and having data models in the background that are describing the environment, the objects the robot interacts with, the robot itself, and also the tasks that are to be executed. And some of them are given by humans using some modeling tools that are here at the bottom level. Some of them are passed on by the customers because they are what also the humans are getting as, uh, as input for their tasks. And some of them, for example, the object models are built up by the robots themselves and uh, are then shared among each other. So if we look at one component, um, the, the ECOS core, because I think that is one that differs more in our environment uh, than um, some of the others here, where we still believe we have good components, but they're not that different from any others. So um, our behavior tree is um, basically the high level coordination entity. So it's the one that is um, pulling together um, the different um, different behavior components. And you see there is a graphical representation of this on uh, how this behavior can be composed, um, how data can also be passed around, something that's not commonly done in behavior trees. Um, and uh, so we can basically build up a library of different, um, different tasks, pull them together, and uh, thereby visualize and um, build the, the behavior specification. And such a behavior model, is really helpful for two cases. One of them is obviously the execution um, and debugging and all these kinds of things. But another one is also the, uh, the analysis of the system because such a high level model also tells us um, which are subcomponents, for example, which is a navigation subtree, which is a grasping subtree. Um, we can do logging and we also can do a posteriori analysis and statistics on this. So um, basically this model also serves as a kind of description of um, like a template of what has been executed. And then the traversal of this tree then gives information on, uh, on the actual instances of this execution. And um, by logging both and combining it, we can do very deep analysis. And then we're gonna come back to this later on how we need this for uh, analyzing the software on, on the deployed systems. Um, what's really important from our experience is to combine this editor, so to do the um, yeah the, the offline creation of the tree, also with an online supervision and debugging. Um, so basically, it's the same content we're seeing here, but um, this is actually happening while the robot is doing tasks. Um, you see how it traverses the tree, how the different um, parts uh, change their status. So um, green is successful, blue is the one that is currently being executed. You can have live introspection of um, all the, the variables, the breakpoints, go stepwise through, um, perform logging, um, hook in your own custom execution functions and all these kinds of things. And um, from our experience, this helps a lot in understanding such complex behavior. Our behavior trees have about 500 nodes. Um, and a very large part of this is uh, really reactive uh, exception handling. So not plain execution of the task, but it's just a fairly small part, but really on what, what do we do in case anything happens. And uh, debugging this properly is a very complex challenge. And um, from our experience, it's really important to have good tool support uh, for managing this complexity and being able to understand what's actually happening. So, um, I mentioned uh, that we want to build the software stack. Um, we started off by building it for our own robots, for Pro and Photo. Um, 
but in the past year we've also started to um, sell it to some first other customers so we're not allowed to talk about all of them but one is um, also our uh, investor and customer Jung Heinrich that use parts of our software for building the next generation of uh, their autonomous vehicles and um, so we see lots of use cases obviously in info logistics because it's, it's very close and you can reuse a large share of the um, the functionality but there are other domains that are currently becoming really active in robotics like industrial cleaning different service robots and construction agricultural robots and um, there obviously you can't reuse for example the box perception and grasping parts but uh, things like the behavior tree and um, some navigation localization systems and so on they are um, pretty commonly also applied in uh, these kinds of domains. Good. Um, <clears throat> that was more the part about how are we programming this robot and which software is on that. In the next part, we'll rather be about uh, the, the meta level of how do we organize the development and uh, the release management and everything in order to bring software to these robots. Because compared to some more classical systems that are uh, designed once and then uh, delivered, these robots are connected to the internet. And on the, on the one hand, that gives us the opportunity that we can make changes, that the system can get better over time. But it also gives us a challenge that um, we have to see how do we actually deploy software updates? How do we ensure that it actually gets better over time and doesn't get worse with every software update? Uh, that we're just reintroducing new bugs with every version. Because in such a complex system, um, that's um, often a danger that um, we have to address. Mm. And this is uh, also the topic of a joint research project with the Fraunhofer Institute for Munich uh, Robot DevOps, where we're looking at how can we um, use methods from other areas of software engineering for robotics. So um, why is this difficult? So I mentioned some of the parts here on the left beforehand. So we're moving from a very deterministic environment and very pre-programmed behavior towards robots that are supposed to work based on perception, um, use machine learning, use AI, use many things that make the overall execution less predictable. So hopefully the robot can react much better to disturbances. Um, but when the robot has more autonomy, it's of course like possible that it also takes bad decisions. We're also moving from robot only areas to uh, collaboration with humans. And that means that um, the humans introduce a lot more uncertainty. Uh, the environment is unknown, and we can't have complete observability of everything or predictability. And as I mentioned, we're moving from a product that is tested at the end of the assembly line and um, is then shipped, where we're flashing the software and then we're shipping it and never see this product again, towards um, basically a network of connected devices um, with continuous updates. And that makes the management of this very different. So it's more of a like a distributed server infrastructure um, rather than um, an automation box like a PLC controller or something that is once shipped and then more or less forgotten un unless the customer sends a service request. And all of these challenges have impact, of course, on how do we organize software development and engineering in-house in order to address them. So we looked around at how other people are doing this and um, outside of robotics, um, the DevOps approaches um, are nothing, nothing new, but still very successful in um, really linking the development and the operations of these systems. And um, basically having yeah, um, lots of feedback loops to these two. And yeah. since we're not having products that are offline, that are prepared and shipped, and then um, basically just have to do their tasks, but we really have a distributed system. Um, it's also about operating the system and, um, um, and maintaining it and ensuring that it's running well. So this operations block is something that in robotics probably only comes in when we have such a such a networked robots architecture. So um, when looking at the, the DevOps ideas and principles, um, there is this loop from planning um, how the software should look like, and of course, doing the implementation, doing testing, but then um, an important part is the release management, um, the deployment and packaging of the, uh, the software and bringing it onto the target system. Um, 
but also to monitor the, uh, the performance of the software and especially the new version or the changes in the live environment and using that as feedback for the next planning. And um, what we've seen is super important, is especially here this part, um, to get information from the systems in the field and using that for prioritizing the work that is done in development in order to work on the right things and to have the maximum impact on, uh, on the overall system performance. So in the rest of this talk, I will focus on uh, three of these aspects because those are the ones that we saw have the biggest difference to traditional DevOps environments. One of them is the testing um, of robots, autonomous robots. Um, another one is um, how to do the releasing and release management. And the last part is the monitoring. So if we look at testing, um, we're seeing that um, testing robot systems unfortunately not as easy as testing a software only component so we have very complex interaction between the different components at the normal dependency level um, but for example also at the behavior level um, when navigation has a problem or has inaccuracies it will also impact the grasping because grasping relies on navigation to be accurately at the target position and so, on. so there are lots of um, also logical connections even if you had your architecture in a very um, distributed and um, decoupled way. Um, in the end, these different components have to work together and have to lead to one smooth execution flow. Um, well, the next one is ubiquitous in robotics, something that probably all of us are fighting against. Robots have hardware um, and they work in an environment. Um, and if we want to test something, we have to replicate this. So. Um, we have to have some model of the robot's hardware. Um, we need to have some model of the environment that gives stimuli and input for the tests, because a lot of the behavior we want to test is actually a reaction to something, some challenges that come in from the outside and are perceived by the sensors. So go through the hardware to the software, and then again from the software through the hardware to the environment. Um, another big challenge is that the robot behavior is often not deterministic. There was sensor noise, there are inaccurate accurate, uh, actuators, um, there are un unknown uh, parts of the environment, for example, how do two boxes um, slide or stick to each other, um, what is their weight distribution, there are many factors that we cannot observe and that we cannot replicate or pre-plan, and um, that leads to tests that also don't have a 100% um, um, outcome. So. Um, we can only say, okay, it has worked in these tests. Um, we can have a broad variation of these tests, but we can only have statistical um, analysis of this. And um, often when performing tests several times, it might be that there are different outcomes because of these unknown factors. And that is of course a challenge in how you design your test pipeline, because usually you write tests in a way that they give a clear zero or one or true or false outcome. Um, and the last part is that these environments are partially unknown, they're changing, we don't see the robots, we don't know how these environments are, they're often remodeled, they change between the seasons, sometimes they're empty, sometimes they're full, um, so the robot also has to be able to cope with these changes. Yeah. Um, so the approaches we're doing, the first one is probably pretty commonplace, but it's, um, from our experience, always important to remind oneself of it is to test as early as possible. So um, use unit tests wherever possible, um, move integration tests as early as possible in the pipeline. So we now have them even before merging a pull request, so before the code actually enters the master uh, branch, so that we can do checks um, as early as possible to keep uh, the rest of the system clean but also to give feedback and fast feedback to the developers so that they know if this is their changes actually work uh, or if they have to iterate again and do something. They don't only need notice this in operation, but we know that as early as possible. Um, the hardware and environment dependency um, doesn't only complicate things, but it's also just plain expensive. So having a large test environment and a lot of hardware um, is just a very cost intensive thing and it's also often slow. So um, we're using lots of simulation in order to automate and um, give feedback early. Um, but simulation always has to abstract away from some hardware aspects. So um, after the simulation tests are successful, we are also testing on physical robots um, in-house and in the test area at the customer sites. 
And um, the last aspect is to improve the test pipeline. So um, not only do it uh, in an open loop fashion, but really get the feedback from bugs that are observed at the customer sites to track closely at which stages in this test pipeline are bugs detected, what's their ratio, how do we, can we improve the, the coverage at specific places in order to catch as much as possible in the very early stages of this pipeline and um, to actively manage this part. The next part is once the tests are successful, how do we actually uh, roll out a release and when do we actually roll out a release? And um, usually in, in a perfect world, we'll say, okay, when all tests um, are green and we have really high confidence that um, everything will work because our tests have, um, have, have, have covered everything. But since the environment is highly complex and there are lots of um, dynamics in there, sometimes the world has to solve problems that we don't even know of when we're deploying this. Um, it's unlikely that we can get the perfect test coverage. So there's always a certain chance that we're missing something. Um, and the problem with missing something is that these changes can result in physical damage um, of the robot or might even injure people, though there is a separate safety controller, but um, robotics is dangerous to some extent. And they can also lead to economical damage if, for example, boxes are destroyed or um, other kinds of goods. So um, there are consequences behind this. And um, therefore, we would like to design the system in a way that even if issues are overlooked, um, we have tools in place to manage the damage that is um, created by this. So what we're doing for this is, on the one hand, to have um, active management of what gets into a release. So to have clear quality criteria and um, have, have a certain barrier that, um, that the, the code has to jump before being being included. Um, then after the in-house tests, um, we also have final tests in the production environment and use, for example, a canary deployment where you're upgrading a single robot out of the fleet first. Um, you're closely monitoring this um, and um, then decide on, um, on how to continue or to use A-B testing for features that can be activated or deactivated. You have two robots with both versions to close the monitor it and you see which one performs better. Um, and uh, in the last step to have we really close, closely supervised rollout. Um, first of one robot to one customer, then more robots at this customer, then moving on to one robot at the next customer and um, track the uh, the data in order to see if there are any issues so um, that we can still stop our rollback uh, this release as well. And the last part um, is about the feedback and monitoring because if we want to react on issues during the rollout, if uh, we want to notice early that a problem actually happened, um, we also want to be in want to need to have the data and the information from the live systems in order to do this. Um, and another motivation we've seen already some years ago is um, that compared to a robot in the lab where you're sitting next to it, you give it a task, you see how it screws up, um, you understand the environment and you can analyze the problem. That changes totally if these robots are not next to you anymore. So if a customer gives the task to robot or the customer warehouse management system, the robot is somewhere in this warehouse, nobody has seen how anything has happened. Um, then the danger is that um, we're not observing problems, but another danger is more at the psychological level that also the developers think that some parts are more important, though they actually don't have that high impact. Um, and um, therefore also this feedback and monitoring is really important to keep the development team aligned with what's happening in the real world and let them work on the important parts. So what we're doing, um, we are getting lots of data from the robots. One part of that an important source of uh, information is, for example, the behavior tree logs. So how we are traversing this tree, how often we are in these different parts, how long the execution takes, how many failures happen in which branches of the tree. And we're using this tree as annotation for all the data in order to um, have like a meta model of the overall execution flow. And we have really detailed um, statistical analysis um, that we can do here in order to see, for example, if one task phase got a higher error rate, um, had um, more retries, had longer execution times after an update. Um, 
we're using this data also for collecting, aggregating, and prioritizing bugs based on which impact they have on the overall performance and some of our core KPIs. And um, once we have the bugs, to use it for um, adapting the test plans so um, that we can make sure that this bug would then be found next time in one of the earlier tests and would not um, come up in production at the customer site. Good. So to conclude my talk and to leave some time for questions, um, we believe that there are three important aspects of um, building software for these kinds of mobile robots. Um, one of them is to have good components is something that I mostly excluded for today, but it's of course the prerequisite that the individual robot algorithms are, are working properly and uh, can handle the complexities that are in the, in the real world. Um, Another important aspect is to have good system architecture that is modular, where we have reusable components, where we have a clear execution model that the human and the system can understand that they can use for automated analysis. Um, and um, that is also extendable. So we, whenever we have to make a change that um, it doesn't lead to like a catastrophic number of um, new connections or other kinds of changes that are um, need to be make, made in order to change anything in this picture. And the last part um, that we believe is really crucial is to have good engineering tools. So for example, have a, a clear editor and a debugger for um, the complex behavior, but also to have tools for, um, for testing and simulation, for monitoring uh, the robot performance, um, for supervising the release rollout and um, yeah, thereby helping to, to bring the software into the systems. So as I mentioned, we're working on um, the, the latter part, the uh, bringing DevOps principles to robotics as part of the robot DevOps project. And if any one of you is interested, um, some shameless advertisement, we're also hiring in this area. So if anyone has interest in, in helping us to bring this further, we're happy to hear from you. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. For your, uh, for your talk. And uh, we have some time left, which is good because we also have quite some questions. Uh, Christoph has asked one question regarding the cloud aspect that you mentioned. How willing are customers in sharing the data from the AGVs to the or to your cloud environment? Um, it, of course, depends on which kinds of customers they are. If, they, if you talk to large automotive companies, for example, it's, it's a different game than um, if you talk to uh, to logistics companies, but um, overall, the companies are seeing that there is a benefit in sharing this uh, this data um, because it's important for us to monitor um, monitor the operation. Um, the robots also have a kind of yeah a call center they can contact. So if there are issues, um, it doesn't have to be somebody on site that is solving this, and um, that just directly saves costs because. Um, Otherwise, you would have to pay a person on site for fixing problems that might always happen, especially when the environment is very uncertain. And um, there are, for example, some boxes that are loosely stacked and that are toppling over. Um, and if things can be done remotely, um, that has a huge impact on the business case. And um, in logistics, that is something very important. In other domains, um, other aspects are more important. But also there, um, the customers are more and more open to this. The next one, uh, Teresa asked, is the Toru robot as fast as the human worker? No, unfortunately not. Um, so humans are um, amazingly fast in, in solving tasks. Um, for example, for bin picking or so, it's, it's impressive. Um, for the domain that Toru is working on, we, are, we still have the, the advantage that a human also has to search. So if you're faced with a box uh, like a wall full of shoe boxes um, and you have to search for a certain uh, a certain barcode in there then a human also has to like blindly search through them and there the robots can benefit from their memories but um, still the robots are somewhat slower than the humans um, they still pay for themselves um, by um, operating longer hours having different kinds of advantages and producing the data um, being very flexible so um, there is a good payback time, uh, but the pay picks per hour of the humans are still in time. Thanks. I'm going to put my question to the end. Um, next one is from Bradley, and he asked, what is the relationship between the behavior programming 
and the software and hardware that is on the robot. Is one fixed before the other is specified or is it more collaborative? Um, well, let's say the, the, the hardware is normally more or less fixed um, because hardware development cycles are more in the half year to year um, range if you're fast. And um, so of course, if we're seeing problems, for example, with one sensor or so, we can do a retrofit, but we try to keep the hardware rather fixed. Um, the behavior programming and the other parts of the software normally go hand in hand because um, whenever a new feature is developed, um, it also has to be integrated into the behavior tree. In our, in our view of the world, the behavior tree is the one that triggers all actions of the robot. Um, it doesn't execute them directly. So there's, of course, the navigation controller that runs at high frequency that is computing uh, like the, the local trajectory out of the global plan and so on. But it's a behavior tree that passes on this tree, uh, this task that is triggering this, that can also stop it. Um, it knows the context. And, um, and therefore, all these actions have to be integrated. And um, for example, if you have to apply some certain processes, safety rules, driving rules, other things. Um, and you need to be aware of what's actually moving in the system in order to properly stop it before, for example, switching to something else. Or if you do exception handling, you need to be sure that, for example, the robot has stopped beforehand. So the behavior tree has to be the one entity that's coordinating these different movements of the system. Okay. Another question by Teresa, and I really like the passive aggressive tone of that one. She asks, uh, shoeboxes are easy peasy. Would it also work with heavy glass bottles inside? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> that, that's actually also how I saw it in the beginning. So, you know, <laughs> I worked with a PR2 robot and some uh, fancy Kuka arms and DLR hands and so on beforehand. And so, like, she was a piece of cake. And uh, we had the plan to move on to something more interesting with the robot arm in half a year, about six years ago. Um, Shoeboxes are surprisingly complex because you have a weird weight distribution in there. Um, you have some heavy parts and not the heavy parts. You have a broad range of surface materials and sucking them is really difficult. Um, and the, what makes it really challenging for us is that they're stacked and we have to unstack them. And um, there, it's not only about um, the, the statics, but also the dynamics. So if you're pushing it back and for example, the higher one is heavier and the middle one is smaller and, um, and lighter, then basically the top box can just topple over because um, it has a higher uh, impulse and so on. So um, the weight is not so much the issue. So with Soto, we have weights of like 20 kilos. So it's not only glass bottles, it's um, actually all of metal parts. These, these plastic boxes are full of metal parts. Um, with Toru, we can also pull up to eight kilos based on the, the suction away um, if we have a good surface. Um, the, the problem is rather on how to handle the dynamics and um, push it back when you don't have full control over this um, over this, this device um, without making huge mess. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. We have three questions left, so let's try to uh, answer them in uh, four minutes. So question by Arne, how often or even at all, do your robots undergo a certification process? To what extent do you have to redo the certification when you roll out new features uh, over the air? And yeah. yeah, so um, we chose the design to decouple the software that I talked about today from the safety related things. So um, we have an underlying safety controller. Um, we use the, the yellow SICK components or something that is pretty common in, uh, in, in mobile robotics for this. Um, had to stretch it a bit in order to be still fast and safe, uh, pretty close to humans. Because if you want to be productive, then safety normally, uh, yeah, stops you from doing so. If safety wants to be wants you to be very slow and safe and and careful. Um, the business case wants you to be fast and aggressive and <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, work in very narrow aisles. So sometimes we're working in with a sixty-seven centimeter robot in eighty centimeter aisles. We have about this much size and both sides and driving fast in these, you need to stretch it a bit. But um, nevertheless, we have one system that is taking care of the safety and is not changed, cannot be changed by the software that we are rolling out here. It's actually developed by a different team in our company. And um, that is a bit of overhead, but it gives the other teams much more freedom uh, because we don't have to do any certification from this. Um, we need to know, we know that basically everything that is like 
human safety related and certification related is already covered. Um, we of course have to make sure that the testing doesn't lead to any um, I mean, collisions with the shelves or had, had whatever were crushed crashing boxes or these kinds of things that would be like economical and physical damage to the robots and the items. Um, but yeah, it's something that is at least one level less severe. Okay, thanks. Next, uh, Shane wants to know in the AI part, do you include agent based models or only ML models? Um, so, so we use machine learning in some parts where yeah, it's commonly used, um, like for barcode um, detection and localization for um, object segmentation and uh, these kinds of things. Um, we use other kinds of AI methods in many other parts of the system. So, um, for example, um, yeah, the behavior tree is a kind of reactive planner. Um, we have like um, CSPs and um, other kinds of AI tools for the task allocation and overall robot co um, coordination. Um, we have actually lots of knowledge representation and uh, diagnostic reasoning for uh, analyzing the exceptions that are happening. Because when the robot perceives some symptoms, it has to conclude from what it's seeing to the root cause. So a common symptom is all motors are offline. Um, but the root cause might be the 15th or so um, item in there that is actually the emergency stop is pressed. And um, then naturally all motors are offline. And um, in these cases, the robot has to analyze them, figure out what actually happened, and then choose the proper escalation. So does it have to tell um, basically one of the, um, the pickers at the customer? Does it have to call the relate remote service? Can it like home a motor again? Um, uh, calibrate the sensor automatically and do other kinds of onboard um, systems here. And um, that's something where we are actually using knowledge representation and uh, diagnostics reasoning for this. So we use lots of also more classical AI parts. Um, we don't directly have like an agent based model in here. Okay. And a good concluding question by Nico. In terms of knowledge transfer from academia to industry, how much CRAM and NORAB is in the ACRO stack? Yeah, okay, so CRAM and NORAB were the, the software stacks we used back in the days for, um, for the, the picking robots. Um, so I think the ideas lived on, but the software changed. Um, so we do use a bit of product actually, like NORAB uh, for this, because we're faced with either building our own rule-based language or using an existing documented one. Um, and it wasn't me pushing it in, but it was my employees uh, asking me if they were allowed to use it in the system. So um, I tried not to bias it too much, so not to use my, my pet projects and bring them in here, but to really see what is needed for the system. And um, so part of our behavior tree Modified behavior tree is inspired for, by what uh, CRAM and the, the high level executive can do. Um, and um, lots of the environment model, uh, the robot self model, uh, the, the reasoning for error explanation, and so on is also inspired by previous works I've done back in the days. Okay, thank you very much for answering the question. And then I would like to switch over to our next session. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.